Okay, so we'll uh, proceed with the next speaker of this afternoon session, uh, Christian Kaltenmaler. Last evening he made us very happy with performances of the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. Now we'll see something about the 21st century. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Obviously, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's an inspiration for a picture. I'm not completely sure when I met him. I think it was the reason he was Well, I certainly remember very rigorously what he's been giving a talk, giving talks in general. First of all, so you must know I'm a combinatorialist. But at the time he was more or less new in the community, so I, we, we didn't know him. And he <coughs> showed us his beautiful ideas that he and Gordon were developing in partition identities. That was already impressive. But in addition, <coughs> to see him speak, so he's obviously a very elegant person, but now when he speaks at all, the way he phrases things is also so elegant. Simply could print what he writes and it gives me the text and um, everything is so crystal clear, motivated. So you can't do it better. So the only way what you can try is to do it differently. And so after I had set the stakes low for myself, I can begin with my thought, which is joint work with Richard Brenn. Ole Wagner, who is sitting over there. And you may have noticed that after all <coughs> the inequalities, approximations, and what we have seen, this session seems to be the session of identities, of quality sign, and so this will be about identities. And the story begins with an email of Ole Wagner. To me, where he says, together with Richard Friend, I have recently been looking at sums of this form, which we call discrete major type integrals. And you see that there are certain parameters, there's the cycle of the gamma, you should in particular remember the gamma, and it's delta. And so this is kind of fundamental product which is taken to some power. And he says at least for alpha, gamma, small, and two, and also small delta, we believe that these sums can be evaluated in close form. So I should briefly explain what is the meta integral. So here it is. It's a certain multiple integral which has this fundamental product raised to some power. And miraculously, it evaluates into a close form expression. That was actually not proved by Meta. He came across this because this was a normalizing factor in random matrix theory. But Bombieri <coughs> found that this is actually a specialization of the now famous Seinberg integral. No, no, no. He showed it to Seinberg and Seinberg got him. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a way to Break it out. Yeah. Right, and uh, so now the Selberg integral is really famous, and this is a special case. And here is the discrete meta integral. Instead of integral, you write sum, multiple sum, you take a fundamental product, raise it to some power, and the replacement for the exponential function is the binomial coefficient. And indeed, <coughs> if you do a certain, if you scale a certain factor and do um, the limit tends to infinity, then you will obtain yeah, uh, this integral on the left hand side. And in the email, he wrote meta type, integral meta type, because we put powers here and put the power of the key is over there. At some stage, we decided to call this McDonald meta integrals because of this kind. He could um, take the 
analog of this in the integral world, and these are integrals which appear in integrals of a standard associated with root system. For the continuum, it is to tell you that the case alpha equals 1, gamma equals 2, delta equals 0, follows from specializing a rectangular sure function in two sets of areas. Indeed, I remember that. So this is the identity it's referring to. This is a special case where the alpha is 1, gamma is 2, and there is no ti here, and it evaluates until it goes to 4. So here's this thing again, but um, for example, all right, so I want to point out one thing here, which I think I forgot, namely in, in our meta type integral that was one binomial condition. <coughs> This identity that Ori was referring to has indeed a second binomial coefficient given. So sometimes you can even put in a second binomial coefficient. So this is this identity again. But um, what about this one? So here, uh, taking bits and powers, I have to put the ti square. So once again, these are our discrete analogs of McDonald's greater integrals. And um, at the time, it seemed that there are 10 cases where the sum evaluates into ghost form. And these 10 cases have two different gammas, gamma equals to 1 and gamma equals to 2. And it seems that one has to separate the two. You can forget about this. Some of them relate to root systems, but it's not important for the talk Yeah. Here are a few examples. This is the one that we saw earlier. This is another one which has squares in the front of all. product. And here's again another one which has squares here and this square here. And indeed, you can put in a second binomial coefficient and it's still evaluated. We treated these 10 cases by essentially four different methods. Here they are. The first one is combinatorial. You count certain objects, and then these identities just um, come out. I will explain that. Second, so this, um, the first method works for some cases with gamma equals 2. And the second, we use identities for just the group characters, so this are uh, things coming from representation theory. This works for the cases with gamma equals 1. Then there's one outlier. Uh, sorry. Then for gamma equals 2, there's actually a transformation formula for the hypergeometric series, which covers a lot. You shall see that. And there's one outlier where we just have an ad hoc approach. In the Many time now, I will briefly sketch mainly the first two approaches. The first one is combinatorics, and I believe it's um, very attractive in the sense that um, this identity here, which I had shown before, has a proof which just contains one picture after I explained how to interpret the picture. Right, so here's the sum side. So you see, um, by the symmetry of the sum and the permutation of the parameters and on the replacement of pi by one uh, by minus pi, the summation this is by the negatives. You can restrict to just one octant, so to speak, of the summation variables, and the only thing is that you have to put a factor in. So let's look at this sum here. And so the question is, how does one generate this fundamental product by combinatorial things? 
And actually what I will actually do is that I generate the square root of this and then I will combine two such objects. So here is this thing again. When you factor it, you have Ki minus Ki, Ki, Ki plus Ki and product of the Ki. So we do it by what I will call non-dissecting lattice path. So when I so say lattice path, then I mean path in the integer lattice with up steps, one one, and down steps, one minus one. So here are a few paths. They have up steps and down steps. And um, they walk along lattice points. And then we have several paths like these. They are called non-intersecting if there are no common points between the paths, which is the case here. This is a family of non-intersecting that is paths. The terminology may be a little bit clear, which is they actually not touching, but this is the term which stands. Right. And then there's a famous uh, many author theorem, because it was discovered and rediscovered so many times. The most general form is due to Bernd Lind's term, 1971, who actually looked at matrix theory and needed this. <coughs> so it says the following. You have given a directed graph. So for us, a directed graph is the integer lattice, where the edges are these up steps and down steps. This is our and then you have a few starting points and a few ending points. The EIs are the starting points, the EIs are the ending points, vertices in the graph. And there's a certain technical property which I will ignore because it will be satisfied in our situation. And then the theorem says if you want to count families of non-intersecting paths, where the i part connects the i starting point with the i end point. Here we would have a typical situation. We have starting points, we have end points, and we want to count all families of non-intersecting paths from here to there. And the theorem says if you want to count this, write down the determinant. This determinant here, where the entry, the IJ entry counts all paths from the J starting point to the I end point. Okay, so what we need is families of paths which have starting points as indicated here as 1, at 0, 1, 0, 3, 0, 5, 0, 7. And then you have ending points which may be anywhere along a vertical line, but uh, the distance should be even between the points. And they must satisfy the property that they never pass below the axis. This is what we need. And to this situation, so now our graph is the upper half plane, we apply the many other theorem. So we want to count the number of families of non intersecting lattice paths from the starting points to this end point with the property that they never run below the axis. We apply the theorem, and um, since it's easy to count the number of paths from a starting point to an end point which do not go below the x-axis, and it's a difference of two binomial positions, we get this determinant. And then some people know that I have written a survey paper on determinant evaluation. And um, <coughs> if you look up here at 30, then it tells you you can evaluate this. And this is the result. And if you look more closely, then you can see this fundamental product in disguise. There's the Kj minus Ki. There's essentially the sum of Ki and Kj, and there is Ki. You just have to do this replacement, Ki by 2Ki plus 1, and you see that this factor 
arises. And now we have the one picture proof of this identity. So this is the identity and this is the picture. <coughs> you take starting points as before. You take ending points at some distance, 2m plus 2m, say, also at um, height 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And then you cut somewhere in between. And now if we look at the left half, and if you fix the crossing points along this line that I have drawn, then we have exactly the situation as before. So the number of families from these starting points to these cutting points is given by our formula. If we look at the right half and reflect the whole thing, same thing. So also this is counted by our, our formula. And if I want to enumerate all families from the starting points to the ending points, I have to take the sum of all possible cutting points. And what is the result? Well, the result is all families from here to there. But this is again a situation that we had before. It's a very special situation. So it's given by a closed formula. If you plug everything in, you have our identity. This was the first method, combinatorics, which works for three identities. <coughs> I promise Jessica group characters. So very briefly. So what about this one? So the difference is there's no square here. So for comma equals one, we always apply Jessica group characters, and this is one example. So how does one prove this? It looks relatively innocent, but it's really not it. So we need characters of orthogonal groups. So let us denote by Fn of R the sum that we want to evaluate. So I apply again is tricked with permutations and sign changes of the summation indices to reduce to a sum over an octant of the summation indices. And then what we want to evaluate is this here, since now I have to be a little bit careful with summation indices being equal to zero. I have this funny thing here, so the delta is the corner of the zero, so it's one in AR is equal to zero. This is a slight correction here. So this is what we want to evaluate. And what we need is what the characters. Here's the definition. I'm more or less just showing it that you know there is a definition. If they are given by ratios of determinants. These are two polynomials in any variables, but actually the denominator cancels in the numerator. So these are really polynomials in x1 up to xn. Same thing for this. They have a meaning in representation theory. They are characters for the irreducible representations of the orthogonal groups and the even orthogonal groups. And then, if we specialize all the variables to one, there is a dimension formula. It's a closed form product, which is very easy to find from the determinant. OK, so here's our sum again that we want to evaluate. Using this earlier specialization, you can identify the sum is essentially and orthogonal character. And this is an even orthogonal character after you have taken certain factors outside. So what you have to do is you have to compute this sum of orthogonal characters. Here, this notation means that the lambda i's are all bounded by r. Okay, 
it's not completely trivial, but we prove that this sum actually factors as a product of two such automatic characters. Is this not McDonald's? And this is a strange identity because here you have an even orthogonal character, here you have an odd orthogonal character, so I don't know any representation theoretic interpretation of this. But the sum above is not McDonald's? Because I'm so, no, this one not. Yeah, this seems to be a new identity. Of course, there are similar identities in the literature, but that one we did not find. Once you are here to specialize all the size to one, then you have this close formula here, here and here, and this is the sum that we wanted, and this is the closed form. That's it. This is the second method, so to speak, which works for the identities with gamma equals one. For each identity, you have to apply a slightly different summation of characters. As I said, there's one outlier. This is the outlier. <coughs> so it has gamma equals two, and it goes to this one here. And we only have a very complicated proof, which I just stretch over. So it's not a known product, it's written as a certain complicated determinant. This is fundamental squared, so you write this as a product of two determinants, you expand the determinants. So I describe here, you expand the determinants, then you get a sum over permutations, and you pull the summations inside, and then what you have here is a hypergeometric summation. <coughs> and indeed, there is something funny here, depending on whether this is here, um, one, two, or three. <coughs> you can apply certain hypergeometric identities to do the summation. If you do it, and that, that's slight like simplification, you end up with a determinant with a checkerboard structure. These are the entries of the determinant. Since this is a checkerboard structure, it factors as a product of two determinants. The two determinants are here. This is clearly a Cauchy determinant. This is not much more difficult, so you can evaluate the two and go down. And you get this complicated. Identity. At some point, Ole asked the question whether there are few analogs of these identities. And indeed, for these identities that come from the classical group characters, the Q analogs are more or less for free because you can use the so called principal specialization of the variables to specialize essentially the XIs to Q to the I the i minus one variations of that, and you get q analogs. For the cases with gamma equals two, I saw that this ad hoc approach that I flashed over works in most cases, and um, I worked out many identities until at some point, so well, here's one of them, so I will not explain the q notations to find them. These are some of the q notations. This is the one that earlier I proved with non-intersecting lattice plot. I don't know how to prove this with non-intersecting lattice plot, by the way. <coughs> but at some point, um, I got the feeling that um, this, because every time I did the same thing, there should be a master identity. And indeed, there is. So this is the master identity. <laughs> it is this elliptic hypergeometric transformation formula that I mentioned earlier. I will not explain the notation. There are theta functions in these things. They are also defined in terms of theta functions. You may think this is a complicated identity, but um, experts like Nick Schlosser will tell you this is not a complicated identity because it fits on one page. <laughs> <laughs> so nevertheless, let me summarize. It is 
certain big expression is equal to another big <laughs> expression. And it is if you do certain specialization limiting cases of this transformation formula, then you get all the gamma equals two cases except for this outlier. So right, who guess who um, found this identity? It was Ole, and he did not make the connection. Those proofs are uh, integrated by Reigns and independently by Kostrom and Gustafson. But uh, I should be fair and mention another incident that took place during that work. When the draft version of the article, Ole wrote that as a byproduct of our results, we can find enumeration formulas for even Sundaran tableau. So certainly I knew Sundaran tableau. These are combinatorial objects which can be used to model odd orthogonal character. But even Sundaran tableau, I said to myself, that's interesting. I should know about this. <coughs> so uh, kindly enough, Ole had provided a reference in this graph. I go to the reference, and sure enough, it pointed to a paper of mine that I had written. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't exactly know what I, we should learn from this. <laughs> Probably I should not think much about it. <laughs> and instead, uh, wish Krishna a related happy birthday. Questions? Did you, did you try to find the higher powers of the discriminant? You don't get anything nice? Yeah, it's, it doesn't, yeah it, it, gets, yeah, it gets ugly. But if you want to go higher, so to speak, yeah. this is the wrong way to do it. You shouldn't take powers, but um, shift it over. And then, then it's also not easy because um, would have found one nice example. Other questions? Then let's, let's